BBC Radio 4 marks the bicentenary of the Slave Trade Abolition Act. Wilberforce sat under an oak tree at Pitt's house. They discussed the slave trade and there Wilberforce said that then so irremediable and so wicked did this appear that he would never rest until he had effected its abolition. He was truly a great man in his time and I think for all time. Join Melvin Bragg for a special edition of In Our Time, exploring the life and legacy of William Wilberforce on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock and again at 9.30 in the evening. This is BBC Radio 4, where now it's time for the Saturday Play. The Loved One by Evelyn Waugh Adapted by Jonathan Holloway with Julian Rhine tutt Mark Gatiss and Jennifer Lee Jellicorse. All day the heat had been barely supportable, but at evening a breeze arose in the west, blowing from the heat of the setting sun and from the ocean. It shook the rusty fingers of palm leaves and swelled the dry sounds of summer the frog voices, the grating cicadas, and the ever-present pulse of music from the ghastly native huts. Here on the scrub languished two Englishmen, each in his rocking chair, each with his brimming tumbler of whiskey and soda, and his out-of-date magazine. These were the counterparts of numberless fellow countrymen who, exiled to the overheated, barbarous regions of the world, share in that warm evening light the illusion of significance. You know, Dennis, I, I suppose I have to admit, as they say around here, I just don't get it. Get what, Sir Francis? Kierkegaard, Kafka, and, and Compton Burnett. I, I, I mean, who are they? Who are they? And what the hell do they want? I've heard of them. They were talked about in London before I left. You put Hollywood. What business have they got sneaking around here? Oh, look at the time. Ambrose Abercrombie will be here soon. Find another glass with you, Dennis, if you can. Certainly, Sir Francis. Evening, Frank. Evening, uh, Dennis. Oh, hello there. Oh, I've been another scorcher, eh? Uh, mind if I take a pew? Good evening, Sir Ambrose. Oh, helping out around the old place then, Dennis. Making myself useful, Sir Ambrose. Fill her up to the top of soda, please. Good man. Ah, coming right up, Sir Ambrose. Capital. Been meaning to drop by for ages. Sorry it's taken so long. That's the trouble with the film business. Rush, rush, rush. But it doesn't do to lose touch. Englishmen need to stick together. You know, you ought not to hide yourself away, Frank. Your drink, Sir Ambrose. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Barlow. What? His name's Barlow. Well, of course it is. <laughs> well, if we don't keep the proprieties, who will? Who doesn't mind, dear Barlow? Well, not in the least, Sir Francis. There you are, then. It doesn't seem like 20 years since you were living just across the street. And you were the only English knight in Hollywood. And chief scriptwriter at Megalopolitan Pictures. And president of the Cricket Club. Indeed, indeed. And then the neighborhood went down. And uh, I went down with it. Now, now, Frank, none of that. So, how are things at Megala? Greatly disturbed. We're having trouble with Juanita del Pablo. Luscious, languid, and lustful, Juanita. Pain in the derriere, Juanita. Mm. She's completely forgotten. She was bought for her eyes that we made her Spanish, mm. that I named her, that I made her an anti-fascist refugee, mm. that I invented a backstory of kidnapping and violation by Franco's Moors. Did Franco have Moors? No idea. Irrelevant, anyway. You know, we kept her in long skirts because of her legs, and used stand-in legs whenever they were needed, and now the League of Decency has decided Juanita is too strongly flavoured, and we've been asked to reinvent her as an Irish colleen. She can't get the accent, and she'll need all her teeth pulled out, 
But instead of being grateful the studio hasn't got rid of her, she's kicking up an almighty stink. She won't have Deirdre because no one can pronounce it. She won't have Una because it sounds Chinese. She thinks Bridget is too common. And how are things with you, Barlow? Hmm? We haven't seen you on the cricket field lately. Uh. Are they taking care of you at Megalow? Getting you in on the right things? Uh, sadly, no. I, I don't seem to have quite made the grade moving from poetry to the movies. Mm. As a matter of fact, my story department contract ran out three weeks ago. I say, did it? Mm. Well, you take my advice. Don't jump at the first thing that comes along. We English have a position to keep up. They like us to be cliquey and standoffish. They respect us for it. Handmade shoes only. No belts, only braces. Always wear a tie. <laughs> Never eat in a drugstore. Obvious, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded. Well, uh, I must be off. No, don't get up. I have a car waiting. I'm dining with some studio people. <laughs> Good night, all. Uh, Good night. He doesn't know you've taken a day job. Um, I managed to write 30 lines of not bad verse today. Would you like to see them? Oh, dear me, no. No, no, no. I, I, I never read unpublished verse. <laughs> In point of fact, I, I never read verse at all, published or unpublished. Uh, fill my glass, dear boy. Uh. I am in the thrall of the Dragon King, the Philistine Colossus. Hollywood is my life. Did you see a photograph some time ago of a dog's head severed from its body, which the Russians are keeping alive for some obscene Muscovite purpose by pumping blood into it from a bottle? Huh? It, it dribbles when it smells a cat. Well, that's us, you know. The studios keep us going with a pump. Thank you, dear boy. Tell me again. Where is it you work? Uh, it's a cemetery for pets. The happier hunting ground. This is Mrs. Theodora Heinkel of 207 Via Della Rosa, Bel Air. I need you to come at once. My little Arthur. They just brought him in. He went out for his thing and never came back. I didn't worry because he sometimes are all day like that. I said to my husband, But Walter, we can't just go out to dinner when I don't know where Arson is. And he says to me, What the heck? You can't stand up to Leicester's scrunchies at the last minute. And there I am, sitting at the table with Mr. Scrunch, when their man comes in with the news. Hello? Are you there? I'll come at once, Mrs. Heinkel. 207 Via Dolorosa, I think you said. Mr. Grunch and Mr. Heinkel had to help me to the automobile. Yes, I, I am on my way, Mrs. Hinkle. Oh, Heinkel! Good evening, Mr. Heinkel. I am the happier hunting ground. Yes, come along in. Uh, will this be large enough? Yes, plenty. This way, through to the pantry. What breed is Arthur? Uh, He's a silly Whereabouts? On the draining board. Oh! Good, you and me. Those short legs, not natural. Ah, here we are. I'll lift him in. Perhaps you wouldn't mind helping me to carry the box. Really? He doesn't weigh much. It's more decorous <laughs> than if I do it alone. I guess you're right. And, uh, right. Shall we discuss arrangements now, or would you prefer to call in the morning? Let's get it over with. Interment or incineration? Burn me? Buried or burned? Burden, I guess. I have some photographs in the van. Oh, yes? yes uh, uh, various kinds of burden. The most expensive you got. Would you like a niche in our columbarium, or do you prefer to keep the remains at home? Mm. What you said first. On every anniversary, a remembrance card is mailed without further charge. It reads, Your little Arthur is thinking of you in heaven today and wagging his tail. That's a very beautiful thought, Mr. Barlow. And shortly after that, little Arthur took his place in the refrigerator next to a Siamese cat, a tin of fruit juice, and a plate of sandwiches. 
I took my supper out and sat down with it in the hope of writing a few lines of verse. I understand it was you who found him. Oh. Mm. That's right, Sir Ambrose. I have no idea why he did it. Don't you? <laughs> the same thing happened to him as happened to you. Megalo Pictures didn't renew his contract. Really? But Sir Francis was so respected. Not anymore. Turned up on the Megalo lot at the start of last week. Wasn't allowed to park his car. A lifetime's memento sapped in boxes in the corridor. Only exec could speak to him was a fellow called Bumblestein Stein or some such, who just wanted to make sure Frank wasn't going to make a fuss, I ask you. As if. <laughs> Oh, I really think Megalo might have kept him on. They wouldn't have noticed his salary. Uh, are you still working in that pet cemetery? Yes. Mm. You know, I wish you weren't. I was sorry when I heard about that. I really think you ought to have gone home once Megalo decided to dispense with you. Uh, well, there's no point in flogging a dead horse. So, I think, given Frank was kind enough to take you in, and given you have some experience of undertaking, I think it's not unreasonable to delegate the funeral arrangements to you. How do you feel about that idea? It's a tragedy. Indeed. Now then, it will be Whispering Glades, of course. Of course. I think it would be useful if you could nose out some of Frank's verse. The popular stuff that went down so well back in England. <laughs> and perhaps you could knock up a eulogy not too long, mind you. <laughs> she entered the room wearing the white livery of her calling. She sat at the table and poised her fountain pen with dazzling professional assurance. This was the creature I had vainly sought for all of my year in exile. Her hair was dark and straight, her skin transparent and untarnished by sun. Her lips promised immeasurable sensuality. Her profile pure and classical and light. Her eyes greenish and remote with a rich glint of lunacy. Is this your first visit to Whispering Glades? Yes, we want my friend buried. Then let me explain the dream. The park is zoned. Each zone has its own name and appropriate work of art. We have single sites as low as $50. That is in Pilgrim's Rest, a zone we are developing behind the crematory fuel dump. Hmm. The most costly are those on Lake Isle. They cost around $1,000. She believed what she said. Its risible qualities passed her by. She was brittle and I could have smashed her to pieces with a coarse remark. And that, I realize, was her allure. Was your loved one married? No. What was his business? He was a writer. Then Poet's Corner would be the place for him. Many of our foremost literary names are cited there, either in person or as before need reservations. You are no doubt acquainted with the works of Amelia Bergson? I uh, know of them. We sold Miss Bergson a before-need reservation only yesterday under the statue of the prominent Greek poet Homer. I could put your friend right next to her. But perhaps you would like to see the zone before deciding? I want to see everything. I'll have one of our guides take you around just as soon as we have all the essential information, Mr. Barlow. Sir Ambrose Abercrombie has asked me to prepare a special service. Oh, was your loved one in films, Mr. Barlow? Yes. In that case, he ought to be in Shadowland. I think he would prefer to be with Homer and Miss Bergson. I presume the loved one was Caucasian? No, he was English. English are Caucasian, Mr. Barlow. This is a restricted park. The dreamer has made that rule for the sake of the waiting ones. In their time of trial, they prefer to be with their own people. Uh, I, I think I understand. Well, let me assure you, Sir Francis was quite white. Let us now decide on the casket. A two-piece lid is the most popular for gentlemen loved ones, only the upper part is then exposed to view. Exposed to view? Yes, when the waiting ones come to take leave. But I, I don't think that will quite do. He's terribly disfigured. I've seen him. We had a loved one the other week who drowned. He'd been in the ocean for a month and was only identifiable by his wristwatch. 
Mr. Joyboy fixed him up so he looked like it was his wedding day. That's very comforting. How will the loved one be attired? Sir Francis was not much of a dandy, and I, I, I doubt he has much in the way of casket wear. Uh, but in Europe, we usually employ a shroud. We have a shroud, split at the back, for ease of deployment. Now, with or without trousers? What precisely is the advantage of trousers? For slumber room wear? It depends on whether you wish the leave-taking to be on the chaise long or in the casket. Yes, not, not the chaise long. Now, before we move on to discuss the application of cosmetics, I have to finish this part of our data collection by asking if you are personally interested in our before-need provision arrangements. Everything uh, about Whispering Glades interests me profoundly, but that aspect, perhaps less than others, um, Besides, I am a foreigner, and I have no intention of dying here. Thank you. Now we move on to the data required by our cosmetician. What did your loved one pass on from? He hanged himself. Was his face much disfigured? Hideously. That is quite usual. Mr. Joyboy will probably take him in hand personally. It is a question of touch, you see. Mm. Massaging the blood from the congested areas... Mr. Joyboy has very wonderful hands. And what do you do? Hair, skin and nails. And I brief the embalmers as to posture and demeanor. I felt the laughter rising in my throat, but I resisted. She ought to have been the confection of a satirist, but she was flesh and blood. To laugh would have been a desecration. Through her pale makeup, I saw the pattern of open pores and the blush of fine down one associates with a lady twice her age. And I was drawn to it, yes. I even began to love it. It is the hardest of all expressions to fix. Serenity. But Mr. Joyboy makes it his specialty. That and the joyful smile of children. Did the loved one wear his own hair? Yes. And the complexion. We normally classify them as rural, athletic, or scholarly. Um, that is to say red, brown, or white. Uh, scholarly. Spectacles? A monocle. They're always difficult. Mr. Joyboy likes to incline the head to give a more natural pose. Monocles fall out. Did you particularly wish to feature it? Uh, it was a very characteristic feature. Very well. Did the loved one pass over using a rope? Braces. Uh, uh, what you call suspenders. That's manageable. We had a loved one who passed over using an electrical cord. That was impossible, even for Mr. Joyboy to fix. I notice that you have a great regard for Mr. Joyboy. He is an artist, Mr. Barlow. What more can I say? Do you enjoy your work? I regard it as a very, very great privilege, Mr. Barlow. Have you been at it long? Eighteen months, Mr. Barlow. Now, I'm nearly at the end of my questions. Is there any individual trait you would like portrayed? Sometimes, for instance, the waiting ones like to see a pipe in the loved one's mouth. In the case of children, we usually give them a toy to hold. Many like a musical instrument. One lady took her leave holding a telephone. No, I, I don't think that would be suitable. Well, that completes my essential data. Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Barlow. When shall I see you again? The day after tomorrow. You'd better come a little before the leave-taking to make sure everything is as you wish. Who shall I ask for? Just ask for the cosmetician of the orchid room. No name? No name is necessary. Mr. Joyboy was not a handsome man by the standards of the film studios. He was tall, but not athletic. Pale, shapeless, fleshy and uninviting. But he charmed with his demeanour, which was one of absolute earnestness. He had taken his baccalaureate in embalming in the Middle West, and he was now an undertaker of high standing, of national renown. Mr. Joyboy was unmarried, and every girl in Whispering Glades gloated on him. Would you like to see him, Miss Thanatogenes? Was Sir Francis a very difficult case, Mr. Joyboy? A little bit, but I think he's turned out satisfactorily. Mr. Joyboy, he's beautiful. Yes, I fancy he has come up nicely. 
He's still supple, and I think we have a couple of hours before we need to determine the pose. The skull drained very nicely. But, Mr. Joyboy, you've given him the radiant childhood smile number three. Yes? Why? Don't you like it? I'm afraid that's not what Sir Francis' waiting one asked for. Perhaps, Miss Thanatogenous... Amy. Amy, your presence means the loved ones cannot help but smile. They were of the same mould. She, very young, but oddly aged. He, charming, elegant, but gangly, and with skin that looked as if it had been soaking in the bath too long. Both pallid and fascinating. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Joyboy. And it seems to me that I am equally unable to stop smiling when in your company. When I am working on a loved one, I cannot help thinking of how I am preparing him for your brilliant final touch. And if my loved ones all have smiles, then they are for you, Miss Thanatogenous. Amy. Amy. Do you think the right eyelid may cause you some difficulty? Perhaps, but I shall work a little cream under the lid and then firm it with number six. Excellent. I never have to tell you anything. We work in unison. Bless you. Shall we pose Sir Francis together, Mr. Joyboy, before he firms too much? Indeed. I shall be next door attending to the mother and child couple. Call me when you're ready. We'll manipulate him together. He may need a little light brushing over once he's in the casket. He may get rubbed. Sir Francis's face was, to my mind, entirely horrible. As ageless as a tortoise and as inhuman. A painted and obscene travesty. By comparison, the devil mask I'd found in the noose was a festive adornment, a thing a naughty uncle might wear at a Christmas party. Oh, God. Is it what you hoped for? More, more, uh, more than I could have hoped for. Is it... Is it is he quite hard? Is it... Firm. Can I touch him? Please don't. It leaves a mark. Ah, everything's set for tomorrow, Barlow. Don't forget your ode. Jesus Christ! I'm sure it will be all right. Uh, 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 yes, indeed. I, uh, I, I shall recite your ode at the graveside and uh, <clears throat> we'll get bloody Juanita or whatever she calls herself now to sing the wearing of the green. Have you arranged the seating in the church? Uh, not yet. Make sure the cricket club are all together and reserve the first three rows for megalopolitan pictures. Will he be like that on show? Um, I thought so. No, I think best not. Um, better to remember the old fellow in life. Coffin closed. Is that all right, young lady? If you wish, although it isn't usual. Best thing, more English. They told me Francis Hinsley. They told me you were hung with red protruding eyeballs and black protruding tongue. I wept as I remembered how often you and I had laughed about Los Angeles, and now tis here you lie, here pickled in formaldehyde and painted like a whore, shrimp pink incorruptible, not lost nor gone before. Hmm. Hello. Hello, who's that? Miss Thanatogenous, the cosmetician attending to your strangulated loved one in the orchid room? Hello. Hello. I'm so sorry. I, I couldn't say it was you, not with the sun behind you. Hmm. Radiant, yes. Shall I take that piece of paper to one of the receptacles? Uh, no, don't, no, don't. Take more out. Got it. Uh, I'm surprised you're still here. I've taken to coming here after work. I'll go some other place, shall Certainly I? not. No, I'll, I'll go. I only came here to write a poem. A poem? Did you say a poem? Yes, yes, I'm a poet, you see. Oh, well, I think that's wonderful. I've never seen a live poet before. I didn't realize we were such a rare breed. Ten a penny in Kent. Did you know Sophie Dalmeyer Crump? No. She's in Poet's Corner now. She came during my first month when I was only a novice cosmetician, so, of course, I wasn't allowed to work on her. 
Besides, she passed on in a streetcar accident and needed special treatment. But I took the chance to study her. She had a very marked soul. But of course, whenever I have a treatment that requires a special soul, Mr. Joy Boy helps me. Would you do me if I passed on? You'd be difficult. You're the wrong age for soul. It is delineated best in the very young or the very old, but I do my best for you. I think it must be a very wonderful thing to be a poet. <laughs> well, you have a very poetic occupation of your own right here. Oh, yes, I know. I know, I have, really. I take it seriously. Only sometimes at the end of the day I'm tired and I feel it doesn't count for much. Is that what you brood about when you come here alone? Only lately. At first I used to just lie and think how lucky I was to have a job here. Don't you think that anymore? Oh, yes, of course I do. Really. <laughs> it's just in the evenings that something comes over me. A lot of artists are like that. What made you take up this job? Surely you couldn't have been interested in this sort of thing beforehand. Well, I've always been artistic. I took art at college as my second subject one semester. I'd have taken it as my main subject, only Dad lost all his money in religion, and so I had to learn a trade. In religion? What, what do you mean he lost his money in religion? Because of the four-square chapel. That's why I'm called Amy. After the founder, Amy McPherson? Clergymen are always poor in England. Oh, that definitely isn't the case here. Really? Uh, what else did you study at college? Just psychology and Chinese. I didn't get on too well with Chinese, but it didn't matter. I did those two subjects for my cultural background foundation diploma. So, what was your main subject? Beauty craft. Really? Ah. And what does that consist of? Permanence, facials, waxing, everything you get in a beauty parlor. Was this a degree? Of course. I wrote my thesis on hairstyling in the Orient. So when did you decide on beautifying the loved ones? I drifted into it after Mrs. Comstock's son asked me to do his mother's hair when she died. I'd been her favorite hairdresser at the Beverly Waldorf, and she was being fixed up over here at Whispering Glades. So I came over here to give her her rinse, and... I'd never seen a dead person before. Colonel Comstock came to see what I was doing, and he said, Young lady, that's a fine and beautiful action. And I saw the way a cosmetician transfigures the departed, and that's how I made up my mind. I went straight back to the Beverly Waldorf and gave Mr. Jeb my notice. Oh, that was nearly two years ago. And you don't regret it? Oh, never for a moment. Do you get paid more than you would in a beauty parlor? A little. But the loved ones can't tip, so it works out about the same. Besides, I don't do it for the money. It's a wonderful thing, knowing that when you start your day, you're going to bring back joy into someone's aching heart. What do you think about when you come here alone in the evenings? Just death and art. Half in love with a useful death. What did you say? For many a time, I have been half in love with a useful death. Called him soft names in many a mused rhyme. To take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. Did you write that? You, you, you like it? Why, it's beautiful. That's exactly what Whispering Glades exists for, isn't it? To cease upon the midnight with no pain. Did you write that after your first visit here? It was written a long time before that. Well, it couldn't be lovelier if you'd written it in Whispering Glades. Was that the kind of thing you were writing when I came along? Not exactly. About six o'clock. I have to go early today. And I have a poem to finish. Will you stay here to finish it? No, I I'll do it at home. I'm I might as well walk you to the gates. I'd love to see the poem when it's done. I'll send it to you. Amy Thanatogenus is my name. I live quite close, but send it here to Whispering Glades. This is my true home. Our evening encounter was a turning point for me. I realized I was attracted to her, or at least fascinated by her, that I must not wound her naivety, that if I couldn't yet afford the passage home to England, then my future in America lay in dead animals. And these things might all be brought together in a union with Miss Amy Thanatogenous. Unfortunately for me, in the days that followed, Mr. Joyboy's developing enthusiasm for Miss Thanatogenous found conspicuous expression in his work. Every loved one that passed through his hands was given a beatific smile, 
assisted by the deft use of a trimmed visiting card, inserted behind the lips in order to wedge them into a simulated grin. And always, as he stepped back to admire his work, he uttered the blessing. For Miss Thanatogenes. As Mr. Joyboy passed among his cosmeticians and assistants, like an art master among his students, he uttered a word of correction here or commendation there, sometimes laying his hand on a living shoulder or a dead haunch. Only Amy Thanatogenes knew he looked upon her with a special favour, and she was disturbed by this. She did not feel herself worthy and viewed the prospect of commune as a kind of violation of the joy-boy aesthetic. Furthermore, she was unsettled by her encounter with me in the grassy glade. I had, it seemed, achieved something of the desired effect. She was attracted to me. We met often, and I wrote her some lines of poetry and passed off others as my own. And in Amy's sweet, confused, slightly mad head, to favour either of us would have been a betrayal of the other. She painted the loved ones diligently, while at the happier hunting ground, I was also busy. I'm going home now. What's left to do, Bennett? Uh, six dogs, a cat, and a Barbary goat. Well, don't waste time or you'll be here all night. Rake them out while the ashes are still hot and leave them in buckets to cool off. They're all home delivery except for the cat. Uh, what should I put on the goat's card? After he's not a dog and he won't be wagging his tail in heaven. Wag their tails all right when they're having a crap. I guess you'll think of something appropriate. Uh, what about your Billy is remembering you in heaven tonight? Excellent, Dennis. You're a real treat. May I sit, Miss Thanatogenes? Oh, why, Mr. Joyboy, of course. I'd be... I'd be honored. Are you having a good day, Miss Thanatogenes? Oh, why, yes, I think I am, Mr. Joyboy. I mean, is there anything wrong? Oh, no, Miss Thanatogenes. Exactly the opposite. I actually wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Joyboy. I mentioned it yesterday to the dreamer. Oh, thank you, Mr. Joyboy. To be brief, Miss Thanatogenes, the dreamer intends to train a female embalmer, and his choice, his very wise choice, has fallen on you. Oh, Mr. Joyboy. And now, if I may intrude a personal note, don't you think this calls for a little celebration? Would you do me the honor of taking supper with me this evening? Oh, Mr. Joyboy, I don't know what to say. I did make a sort of date. But that was before you heard the news. That puts rather a different complexion on matters, wouldn't you say? Besides, Miss Thanatogenes, it was not my intention that we should be alone. I wish you to come to my home. Miss Thanatogenes, I claim as my right the very great privilege and pleasure of presenting the first lady embalmer of Whispering Glades to my mother. How much extra do you think you'll get paid? Oh, I don't know. I didn't go into that. Found to be something handsome. Could be a hundred a week. Oh, I don't expect anybody except Mr. Joyboy gets that. You could get married on half that. Excuse me? What? What did you say? I, I mean, fifty would be enough for us to afford to get married. And what makes you think we might get married? Oh, I see. P perhaps we've been misunderstanding one another. I'm in love with you. I... I don't understand. Haven't you been listening to my poems? I'm confused. It's only the money that's been holding me back. I assumed you knew that. Now you'll be earning enough to keep us both. There's nothing to stop us. The money? An American man would despise himself if he had to live off his wife. Yes, yes, but I'm European. We just don't have such prejudices in the older civilizations. I'm not saying 50 is any kind of a fortune, <gasps> but I certainly don't mind roughing it a little. I, I have to say, I think your attitude is contemptible. Don't, don't be an ass. I'm going now. But, I doubt please. we'll see each other again. No, please, don't be silly. It's so disappointing. Well, at least you shan't be disappointed again. Enjoy your supper with the joy boy. I expect, at the very least, it'll be curious. Here we are, Miss Thanatogenes, my home. Oh. 
I see you're asking yourself why a man of my stature, a, a Rotarian, a man who is a regular contributor to the printed pages of the casket, should choose to live in such an unprepossessing neighborhood. Um... Well, there's a reason for everything, if we might but fathom it. I'm saving, and I'm saving hard. One day I will own a real house with real children in it. But until then, with care, Miss Thanatogenous, with care. You, Mom, here we come. Sit down quietly, dear. Just until this is over. The old lady hates to miss the political commentaries. Quiet! This program was brought to you by courtesy of Kaiser's Stoneless Beaches. Turn it off, dear. No other peach now market. Well, he says there'll be war again this year. Mom, this is Amy Thanatogenous. Very well. Supper's in the kitchen. You can get it when you like. Hungry, Amy? No, uh, yes, uh, I suppose a little. Let's go see what kind of a surprise the little old lady's been cooking up for us. Just what you always have. I ain't got time for surprises. Show her the parrot, son. Show her the parrot. Oh, dear. Gosh. That's Sambo. Sambo? Sambo. But he doesn't have any feathers. Won't you speak to your brother? Well, here to love me, then I might as well be dead. Well, Amy, a comforting repast, as one might say. Tin noodle soup, salad mixed with tin crab, then we'll have ice cream with our coffee. Shall we carry it back through? <coughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm getting a bit of a headache. Oh, dear. Amy... Would you like me to find something in the medicine cabinet? No, uh, really, I'll be fine. I just need some fresh air, I think. Perhaps a few moments outdoors. But I'm sorry, I don't think I'll be able to finish this. You come with me. What's the matter with her? She'll be okay. We'll be back in a moment. I'm afraid I think I need to go home. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry too, but with a head like this, I don't imagine I'll be very good company. I'd drive you home, only I don't like to leave Mom. The streetcar passes the corner over there. You'll be all right. Oh, yes, I'll be all right. Mom just loved you. Really? Did she? Oh, yes. I can always tell when she takes to someone because she treats them natural, same as she treats me. She certainly treated me natural. I'll say she did. Well, night. Night. I'll close the door so as to keep the heat out. Fine. <sighs> From the earliest days, Californians have restlessly sought meaning through cults. One of Los Angeles' weekly papers had its own spirit guide called the Guru Brahmin, and Amy was a regular correspondent. And while the memories of the naked parrot and the tin soup were still fresh, she put pen to paper. She was soon being read by the two gloomy men and the bright young secretary, who were, in reality, Guru Brahmin. Dear Amy, I am the tiniest bit worried by the tone of your last letter. A home-loving, home-making American girl should find nothing to complain of in the treatment you describe. A time will come, Amy, when your own son will bring a friend home. You say he looked undignified in his apron. Surely it is the height of true dignity to help others regardless of convention. The only explanation for your feeling of disappointment and the dramatic change in the affection you have for him is that you do not really love him in the manner he might have the right to expect. In which case you should save him further suffering and tell him the truth at the first opportunity. Regarding your more racy friend, the poet, I will leave it to your good sense to distinguish between the flimsiness of glamour and the fundamental importance of true worth. Poems may be nice things, but, in my opinion, a man who will cheerfully take his part in domestic life is worth ten glib poets. Amy put the newspaper down and reread the latest of the many poems I had sent her since she'd walked away from me on the waterside bank at Whispering Glades. 
Her little hands are soft, and when I see her fingers move, I know in very truth that men have died for less than love. Oh dear, live, lovely thing, my eyes have sought her like a prayer. Oh, oh dear, oh dear me, what on earth shall I do? Mr. Schultz, I want to improve my financial position. It can't be done. Not at present. If the business looks up, then you're first in line for a raise. I'm thinking of getting married. My girl doesn't know I work here. She's very romantic. I don't know what she'd think of this business. Take the end of this casket. Pastor will be here in half an hour. Dog that is born of bitch hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. What did you say? How does one become a non-sectarian clergyman? I mean, is there a non-sectarian bishop who ordains them? Why do you want to know? Well, you see, I'm somewhat torn between making a go of this business, which I seem to have some talent, or going the whole hog, so to speak, and getting a real purchase on death by becoming a pastor, a non-sectarian one. It seems to me there's a living in births, marriages and deaths, and given I have a poetic soul, I think I might make rather a good fist of the thing. Especially if one doesn't need a license from some governing body, but just sets one's stall out wherever one fancies. You're a crazy limey, Dennis. <laughs> I guess, as you say, you just call yourself the pastor and set up shop. Now, can we get this mutt into the incinerator? I'm so pleased you felt able to see me again, Amy. So pleased. Where are we going? I have made a decision. Good, good. I'm glad. What about? Us. We're going to a special place the dreamer included in his design of Whispering Glades in order to blend passing over with joy and new life. We're going to the lover's seat. Excellent. Here it is. See? Ah, there's an inscription. Yes, there is. It's a special place. Holy, one might say. This seat is made of authentic old Scotch stone from the highlands of Aberdeen. Into it is incorporated the ancient symbol of the heart of Bruce. It doesn't sound as if the dreamer has ever visited Scotland. I have something serious to say, and I'd really rather you didn't start being English. What do you mean? Pouring cold water. We're here to recite the oath and join our lips together through the heart of the Bruce. Fine. I, I didn't mean to pour cold water. It's just the way we are, us English. Together, then. Let's mm -hmm. read it together. Uh, until... Till a, the seas, the seas gang, gang dry, dry, my dear, and, and the rocks melt, melt we the sun, the sun. I, I will lose thee still, my dear, dear while, while the sands of life, life shall run. run. And now the kiss. Till the seas gang dry, my dear. The long inscription on the back of the seat mentions a canty day. What's a canty day, Dennis? Uh, no idea. Something like Hogmanay, I expect. And what's Hogmanay? Uh, people being sick on the pavement in Glasgow. Oh. There's also a reference to sleep together. I suppose you wouldn't like to follow a kiss through the heart of Bruce with a bit of that too, would you? Dennis, why is all the poetry you're interested in so coarse? It seems especially inappropriate if you're considering being a pastor. Non-sectarian, but I incline towards the Anabaptists. Actually, I've no idea whereabouts I'll end up on the playing field of religious observance. Anyway, everything is ethical to engaged couples. You do understand that we are now officially betrothed? Oh, yes, yes, I absolutely understand. Are you pleased? Of course. In that case, I shall write to Mr. Joyboy to make the position clear. Now, I was definitely very confused. While the possibility of physical love with my pallid, innocent, lonely companion in Barmer was one thing, the notion of marriage, good and solid, felt like quite another. I suspected I was, as they say, cooling off. But Amy barged on and, in fact, wrote two letters. The first was to Mr. Joyboy, informing him of the changed world we now all shared. The second, after a few days' gap, was to the Guru Brahmin, informing him, who was in reality them, of the repercussions of her choice.
She complained that the effect both of her choice and her honesty had been a definite souring of relations between Joy Boy and herself, and a consequential darkening of the previously happy atmosphere at Whispering Glades. She also took the opportunity to complain of the manner in which I quizzed her concerning the more intimate aspects of preparing a corpse for the afterlife, a preoccupation of mine that she found unsettling. In fact, I was hoping to gather intelligence useful to my post at the Happier Hunting Ground. I find the poems you deliver to me at work very encouraging. I just wish I could persuade Mr. Joyboy out of his sorrow. From what you've said, it sounds to me like he's more angry than sorrowful, and I wouldn't put it past him to get a little vindictive as well. well I think you're right. I haven't heard any more about me becoming an embalmer. I reckon Mr. Joyboy has ruled that out.、Mm, just as I suspected. But I think you're wrong about sorrow. I do think he's genuinely very upset. How can you tell? By the appearance of the loved ones he sends through to me, they used to appear with the most beautiful smiles, and he'd say they were smiling just for me. Now he sends them through wearing expressions of real woe. It wrings my heart to know he feels like that. It really does. I think perhaps you're wasting too much sympathy on Mr. Joyboy. And his mom's bald parrot has died. <laughs> Some of your less naughty poems might have the ability to warm a wounded heart. Besides my own, I want to ask you for something. Fire away. I want to give some of your poems to Mr. Joyboy to cheer him and make peace. Please, my my precious, they're yours now, and you may do with them as you wish. That poem you left on Mrs. Krupnik's stomach—I assumed it was for me. It was. Well. It was a very beautiful thought, Miss Thanatogenes. My fiance wrote it. The Britisher? Yes, he's a very prominent poet in England. Is that so? I don't recall meeting a British poet before. Is that all he does? He's studying to be a pastor. Really? If you have any more of his poems, I would greatly appreciate seeing them. Why, Mr. Choyboy, I didn't know you were one for poems. Sorrow and disappointment kind of make a fellow poetic, I guess. And I can't help thinking some of them are rather familiar. May I ask what arrangements you have made for your mother's parrot? I know she must have taken his death very hard. The funeral is on Wednesday at the Happier Hunting Ground. It will be a difficult occasion. Would you like me to accompany you, Mr. Joyboy? It might be of some help, perhaps, with Mrs. Joyboy. Would you really come, Miss Thanatogenes? Wow, I call that real nice. And so Amy's world was churned over. Her visit to the Happier Hunting Ground brought her face to face with me over the parrot's grave, and she suddenly knew me for a liar. As I winked at her over the gorgeous little casket, in her mind everything crashed into place. I saw it happen: my lies about how I spent my days, my quizzing her on the more delicate aspects of embalming. I thought it better to lay low for a while, and then I saw the announcement of her new engagement. Hello, Amy. Amy, I want to talk to you. There's nothing you can say that means anything now. But my dear girl, you seem to have forgotten that we're engaged to be married. My theological studies are coming on a pace. The day when I shall claim you is at hand. I'd rather die. Ah, well, I confess I'd overlooked that alternative. But do you deny that you had solemnly sworn to marry me by the heart of Bruce? A girl can change her mind, can't she? Well, you know, I don't honestly think she can. You you made a solemn promise after all. Under false pretenses.、Oh. All those poems you sent me, I thought they were wonderful. I learnt parts of them off by heart. Mr. Joyboy has found you out there all by other people. Is that、I、what you're upset about? That and the happier hunting ground. I thought you were just interested in my work, but you were stealing commercial secrets. You can't walk down the street crying like that. Let let me drop you home. I don't believe in you. And I shall never believe anything you say ever again. But there's a great deal of difference between believing someone and, and believing in them. I can't stop being English again. Very well, Bose. I'm sorry. Sorry the Joyboy Parrot's funeral turned out so badly. 
but it really was a daft idea to have the parrot lying in an open casket. Oh. Parrots don't lie flat in death. Leave me alone, will you? Dearest Amy, you loved me and swore to love me eternally with the, the most sacred oath whispering glades can offer till all the seas gang dry, my dear. You have to understand. Indeed, you have to take responsibility for your actions. If you've sworn by the heart of Bruce, then it would be a sin to go to bed with old Joy Boy. I wasn't even sure I meant it, not sure why I pursued her still. Was it for her sake? But whatever madness possessed me, I had worked my magic, and there she stood, shaking with guilt. You could release me. Ah, but I won't. Not when you know I've quite fallen out of love with you. But you haven't. When I turn away, I forget what you look like. When you're not there, I don't think of you at all. I don't believe you. Look, s stop running away, will you? Hello? Please, please come over. I'm so worried. I speak up, honey, baby. I can't quite hear you. I'm so miserable. I, I can't hear you because Mom's got a new bird and she's trying to make him talk. Maybe we better talk about whatever it is tomorrow. Please, dear, come right over now. Why, honey, baby, I can't leave Mom the very evening her new bird has arrived. Can I? How would she feel? It's a big evening for Mom, honey, baby. I have to be here with her. It's about our marriage. Yes, honey, baby, I, I kind of guessed it was. Plenty of little problems are bound to come up. They all look like nothing in the morning. H have a good night's sleep, honey baby. I must see you. Now, honey baby, I'm going to have to be firm with you. Just do what Papa says or Papa's going to be real mad with you. <sighs> Hello, Los Angeles Weekly. Hello, I want to speak to the Guru Brahmin. He doesn't work evenings. I'm sorry. It's very important. Couldn't you please give me his home number? There are two of them. Which one do you want? Two? Um, I want the one who answers the letters. That will be Mr. Slump. He doesn't work here after tomorrow. On account, he's been fired. And he wouldn't be at home anyhow. The editorial writers mostly go up to Mooney's saloon after work. And is Slump really his name? Sure is, sister. The number's 37550. Hello, Mrs. Mooney. Could I speak to Mr. Slump, please? Hello, Mr. Slump. Oh, Slump. Oh, I found you at last. I am Amy Thanatogenes. Do you remember me? Sure, I do. Mr. Slump. I am in great distress. I need your advice. You remember the Englishman I told you about? The poet guy? Yes. Look, I'm sorry, miss. After tomorrow, I, I don't do this anymore. So I guess you just better find a nice high window and jump out. At 5.25 a.m., it was still night. Amy awoke from an unwholesome, barbiturate-induced and fitful repose. She dressed and went out under the arc lamps. She met no one during the brief walk to Whispering Glades. There was a side gate open for use by night staff. She found the scotch bench in the dark and waited for the dawn. The east lightened. She went into the building and made her way to the embalming rooms. There, in Mr. Joyboy's own workroom, she found the wide mouth blue bottle and the syringe. Amy filled her veins with the liquid that was more usually reserved for suspending the loved ones. There was no letter of farewell, and nothing to say why. She would be a loved one now, and by the time the sun was fully above the horizon and flooding the room, she was at rest. <laughs> Mr. Barlow! Why, oh, Mr. Joyboy! What brings you here so early? Not another parrot. <laughs> it's Amy. She's dead. What? What, my fiancé? No, my fiancé. Joy Boy, this is no time to wrangle. What makes you think she's dead? She's in my workshop, under a sheet. What? But it can't be her. She, she was poisoned, cyanide, self-administered. I, I loved her. Yes, I... Did, well, never mind that. What have you done with her? I examined her, then I covered her up, then I put her in the refrigerator. Why have you come to me? It's your fault. Now you've got to do something. In actual fact, you are the man who's publicly engaged to her. If moral approbation falls anywhere, it'll fall on you, of course. 
I never thought her to be wholly sane. She was my... Don't say it, Joy Boy, or I shall knock you out with that spade. You better come inside. <sighs> what are we going to do? You're worried about your career? Yes. You're worried that Dr. Wilbur Kenworthy, otherwise known as the Dreamer, owner and moving spirit behind Whispering Glades, will turn you out if the poison corpse of a former employee, who also happens to be your fiancé, is discovered in the icebox. So, I assume you want me to help you dispose of the body. Is that right? Yes. She was just a simple American girl. You came to her with your phony poems and your carping English nonsense no, and you uh, swept her away, turned her upside down. You've got to help me. I haven't got to do anything, but I might choose to. Now listen, I have here at my disposal an excellent crematorium. No. We are happy-go-lucky people at the Happier Hunting Ground. There are a few formalities. If I arrive with a casket and I say, Mr. Schultz, I have a sheep here to incinerate, uh. he will say, go ahead. All we have to do is collect our loved one and bring her here after hours. She lived alone. She has no friends in this city. All you have to do is concoct a story that, in the days running up to your wedding, Amy Thanatogenus told you she had decided to return to her first true love, the English poet. All that is necessary is that I should disappear at the same time. You will receive commiseration. I shall be condemned. The matter will be over with. Now, I know you planned an especial future for yourself, and you squandered your todays in near penury, so I assume you have substantial savings. Uh, I have some insurance. What can you borrow on that? Five thousand dollars? Draw it out, Joy Boy. And empty your current account for me too, and buy me a Cunard ticket for London, leaving New York in about three days' time. Oh, I can't bear the thought of it going out like this. Oh, I, think, I think there should be a service? Yes, definitely. I thought it could be my first as a non-sectarian pastor. I'm going to send you a postcard tomorrow. What are you talking about? And again on the same day, in perpetuity. And I shall make it my business to know your address. Always. What kind of postcard? Your little Amy is wagging her tail in heaven tonight and thinking of you. The Loved One by Evelyn Wall was adapted by Jonathan Holloway. Dennis Barlow was Julian Ryan Tut, Amy Thanatogenis, Jennifer Lee Jellicorse, Mr. Joyboy, Mark Gatiss. Sir Francis Hinsley was Clive Swift, Sir Ambrose Abercrombie, David Troughton, Mrs. Heinkel and Mrs. Joyboy, Barbara Barnes, and Mr. Heinkel, Schultz and Slump, Peter Marinka. The play was directed in Bristol by Tim D. Was Bach's Toccata written by Bach? We delve into a musical mystery next after a look ahead to four o'clock with Martha Carney. It's called The Silent Killer.